I'm very happy when this kind of thing happens. I learn a trick for solving one problem, and then a few weeks later I get the chance to use the same trick in a different problem. So today we're going to solve this kind of difficult trigonometric equation, and I'm going to be using pretty much the same technique as I used in this other video. In that case, I was trying to solve an integral. So one of the points that I was trying to make in that video is that the clever idea that is going to solve the question didn't come out of nowhere. It came from things that I have seen before. And in the case of what we're going to do today, it's going to be even more clear because it's not just going to be similar to something that we've seen before. It's going to be the exact same thing. But if you feel that you haven't really mastered trigonometric equations yet, maybe this is not the first video that you should watch because this is a particularly complicated one. I have two other videos that are about the simpler kinds of trigonometric equations. Those are techniques that you are going to need a lot more often than what I'm going to do today. And all of that is linked in the description of this video so you can choose which suits you better. In any case, one of the apparent difficulties of this equation is that it's mixing up the sines and cosines of 2x with the sines and cosines of just x. So the usual technique that I do when I see this kind of thing is to try to bring it all together by using the double angle formulas on that side. That makes me feel better because now at least all of the trigonometric functions that I'm seeing in the equation are dealing with the same angle, which is the angle x but I still have sines and cosines mixed up. And then my standard technique for this type of situation is to just use the Pythagorean identity and just choose one. And this equation is pretty symmetric in the sense that everything that is happening with sine is also happening with cosine, so it really doesn't matter. I am just arbitrarily going to choose to put everything in terms of sine of x. I don't really do this for every single equation that I solve, but this one is very long and confusing, so I am just calling sine just S and cosine C just to make everything shorter. And now that I have everything in terms of just S, we can really see how complicated this is, right? This is not feeling like, in this case, the standard things that I do for every equation are really the best choice. Because if you do want to continue down this path, the next thing that you need to do is to make these square roots disappear, but there's one there, one here, so you want to put them both on the same side first before you square both sides. And squaring both sides in itself is a move that you have to be careful with, because every single time that you do this, it means that in the end of the solution, you are going to be finding too many answers. Some of them will be correct, but others will be false solutions that come from the fact that you are squaring both sides here, okay? So for some values of s, that left side is equal to minus this right side, which is not what you want, but when you square both sides, you don't see the difference anymore. So those non-solutions are also going to appear in the end as solutions, which is fine if you're used to it. You just know that if you've done this, uh, in the end, you have to check for every solution that you find if it's actually a solution of the original equation. But in this case, it's even worse because what we're getting here right now is a degree four polynomial, which is not really the kind of thing that we are used to solving. Uh, but at least this one is a little bit more friendly than it could be because all of the odd exponent terms are going to cancel out you have the minus 4s to the third there canceling out with this one, and you have the 4s here canceling out with this one. And you can solve that. It's one of those cases where you just treat s squared as the variable of a quadratic equation. So here's the quadratic formula, and the two values of sine that I am finding as possibilities are not surprising at all, by the way, because for a problem that is supposed to be solved without a calculator, these are pretty much the only choices. So we could have guessed that those would be the potential values of sine without actually doing anything. But that is not what I wanted to show you. That is the brute force approach. And in a sense, it always works if you are patient enough and don't make mistakes in calculations. But I want to show you something more interesting. 
Notice how both sides of this equation are using the same combination of sine and cosine. It's a sine minus a cosine of the same angle. So it's sine x minus cosine x, and over there is sine 2x minus cosine 2x. So what I want to do is to look at that function, the function sine of x minus cosine of x. So I'm putting on the graph not sine and cosine, but sine and minus cosine, because now I want to add those two graphs together. I start by marking some easier points, which is everywhere that one of them is equal to zero, then the value of the addition is going to be just the value of the other one. And then basically just connecting the dots. I did this way more carefully and slowly in the other video that I mentioned before, but it's there is a symmetry here that the maximum of the function that I'm drawing needs to be at the intersection of these two functions, which is at pi over 4. Well, 3 pi over 4 in this case, because it's upside down. But either way, the value of the purple function is going to be the square root of 2 at that maximum point, because at the intersection, they are both root 2 over 2, and I'm adding them. Same thing happens here at the minimum. And if you keep going to the left a little bit, just to see the other local minimum there so that you can see one period of the function. This is the function. The amplitude is the square root of 2 for the reasons that I was mentioning before. There is no vertical translation. The period also hasn't changed. But there is a horizontal translation because I'm choosing to work with a sine function and it should be starting here. So it has shifted pi over 4 to the right which is why I'm putting this horizontal translation here. And I could have chosen to work with a cosine function as well. It doesn't matter. I would just have to figure out what the appropriate translation was. So that is the function that I want to put on the right side of my equation. And the interesting thing is that on the left side, I have the same function, but with the angle 2x instead of x. And if it's making you a little nervous to multiply the x by 2 over there, but not multiply the pi over 4 also by 2, uh, just keep in mind that this is a function that you might call g of x, and what's happening there is just a composite function, okay? It's g of 2x, so it really is just the x that becomes 2x. You're not multiplying anything by 2. And another thing that can be making you nervous at this point, if you're thinking of, am I showing my work in this question when I'm doing this trick, um, you can justify that this is equal to that without going through all the complex numbers stuff that I did in the other video, okay? You can um, make this little sketch like we did here just to figure out what the function is, and then you can prove that this is actually equal to that by just applying a compound angle formula here, and everything is going to work out. The problem that we're having right now is that we seem to have simplified our original equation because there's fewer things going on, there's just two signs, but they are not of the same angle because this is x minus pi over 4 and that is 2x minus pi over 4. So you could use compound angle formula over there to separate that into x and x minus pi over 4. Then you would have this one again, but then the x would be the odd one out. I think it's better to do it this way. Uh, pi over 4 is pi over 2 minus pi over 4. And I'm going to use the compound angle formula to separate this from this. Because this one is just going to be in numbers. It's not going to bother me. The sine and the cosine of pi over 4 are just the square root of 2 over 2. And that one, this is twice as this one. So we're going to have an x and 2x in the same equation. And those numbers actually cancel out. The square root of 2 that was already there with the square root of 2 over 2, that is the sine and the cosine of the pi over 4 that are appearing when I use the compound angle formula. And it may seem that I'm just going in circles because in a sense, I am. Now I'm back to an equation that has y and 2y that is very similar to my original equation that has x and 2x up there. But it is a little bit different and it's not because this was a plus and that was a minus. It's because I only have one trigonometric function appearing on the right side of the equation when up there I had two. And that is exactly the effect that happened from the very convenient choice of 
x minus pi over 4, which happened when we drew the graphs of the functions and did the graphical adding of the sine and the cosine. Because now in this one, I'm very comfortable just using the brute force approach. I'm putting the names of s for sine and c for cosine to shorten my equation. I've used the double angle formula here and here. Now I am going to use the Pythagorean identity to turn this cosine squared into 1 minus sine squared. But I'm only doing that to the c squared, okay? I'm not going to substitute also the c because I don't want to deal with that square root that forces me to put both sides of the equation to the power of 2. So here I have a 1 canceling with a 1. One of the solutions to this equation is easy to see. It happens when sine equals 0. And the other one is going to be when I divide both sides of the equation by s. And the thing about this equation is that I have to divide it by negative 2 on both sides. But when I do that, I'm going to have sine minus cosine on the left. And that is the same function, sine minus cosine, that I have been using to simplify my equation from the beginning. So I get to use it again. So here is that calculation. I divided both sides by negative 2, like I said I was going to do. Now I am just using my function g of y here, which is this. Now I'm going to divide both sides by the square root of 2. And at the same time, remember that y is x minus pi over 4. So this is x minus pi over 4 minus pi over 4. So it's x minus pi over 2. All that I still need to do now is to put it in the unit circle to figure out what the values of x are. So if the sign is negative half, then it's here, which means that these are the values of x minus pi over 2. And now I have to add pi over 2 to those to get the values of x. So here I have two of the solutions to my original equation. I still have to think about this one to get the final solution. And that was the sign of y equals 0. So that means that x minus pi over 4 has to be here or here. And of course, it could be 0, pi, 2, pi, 3, pi. But I am choosing 0 and negative pi just because I remember the domain of the original equation. And these are the answers that fit into the domain. Okay, it's x equals pi over 4 and x equals minus 3 pi over 4 together with these other two solutions that we've already found. Here is a picture showing both the left side and the right side of that equation with their four points of intersection so that we can see that our solution is actually correct. Those are the four points. And that's it. Uh, I just wanted to show you this technique for solving this equation because I thought it was fun. I, Like I said in the beginning, it made me happy to reuse a uh, technique that I had already used in a different context. But I am not necessarily suggesting that this is easier than the brute force approach that we did in the beginning, okay? They both have advantages and disadvantages. They both involved a little bit of calculation. I think this one we had to calculate less than in the other one. But it definitely wasn't one of those clever tricks that makes the problem dissolve and you basically don't have anything left to do. No, we still had to do a bunch of stuff here. So let me know in the comments which one is your favorite. Are you going to try to do something like this the next time that you see uh, an equation that looks like there is a combination of trigonometric functions to be used in a clever way? Or do you prefer to always use the brute force approach and just have patience and pay a lot of attention to the tiny details so that you don't make mistakes along the way. Let me know.